good afternoon. I take a while. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I think we'll get started. We normally don't have such a rowdy crowd for the endowed lectures. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for the annual Ralph F. Fuchs Lecture. The Fuchs Lectureship in Law was established in 1993 to honor the memory of Professor Ralph Fuchs, a distinguished and respected member of our faculty who served from 1945 until his death in 1985. Professor Fuchs was an accomplished teacher and scholar and a pioneering scholar in the area of administrative law. But he was equally well known for his lifelong commitment to public service and for the dedication, creativity, and compassion he brought to that work. He was the first chairman of the executive board of the Indiana Civil Liberties Union, active in the NAACP, and was appointed to its state committee on legal redress. He was also deeply committed to defending the rights of free speech, free press, and free assembly in the university context, eventually becoming president of the American Association of University Professors. Past lectures have included some of the nation's top lawyers and scholars, all with deep commitments to public service. They include Morris D., civil rights lawyer and co-founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center, Elliot Els Milstein, professor of law at the Washington College of Law and the past president of the American Association of Law Schools, Jerry Kang, a former vice chancellor and professor of law at UCLA, Professor Letty Volp from UC Berkeley Law, Professor Tracy Miras from Yale Law School, Lee Gallant from the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project in New York, and most recently Robert Chang from the Korematsu Center of Law and Equality at Seattle University. We are honored today to be able to welcome Professor Ingrid Eagley to this long and distinguished list of speakers. At this point, it's my privilege to invite Professor Jay Krishnan, the Stewart Professor of Law and the Director of the Stewart Center on the Global Legal Profession, to introduce Professor Eagley. Professor Krishnan, the floor is yours. So I just want to uh, begin by saying how wonderful it is to have uh, Professor Ingrid Eagley here with us today. Uh, I'm also uh, really thrilled that so many of my uh, fabulous and brilliant students uh, are here, as well as my colleagues, uh, and friends of the law school community. Now, I think this is going to be really a wonderful, wonderful seminar. Uh, so just as a bit of background on Professor Eagley, uh, she is a professor of law at UCLA School of Law, as uh, Dean Paris said, and she's the faculty director of the criminal justice program there. Uh, her teaching and research interests include immigration law, criminal law, evidence, and public interest uh, lawyering. Uh, in 2017, Professor Eagley received UCLA's Distinguished Teaching Award, and previously she served as faculty director of the Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy. Uh, Professor Eagley is a renowned expert in the intersection uh, between immigration enforcement and, criminal, and the criminal legal system. Um, her recent work explores a range of topics, including the criminalization of migration, uh, police policy making, and US immigration courts. Uh, Professor Eagley's scholarship has appeared in several of this country's most prestigious law reviews and peer-reviewed journals. Uh, she currently serves as the co-editor of the widely read Immigration Law Prof blog, which is the go-to resource on immigration law for academics, policymakers, judges, and others interested in immigration. And uh, she was just recognized as the second most cited immigration law scholar in the United States uh, for the period between 2016 and 2020. Now, Professor Eagley is a graduate of Princeton University and Harvard Law School. Uh, prior to going into academia, she clerked for the Honorable Judge David Kaur of the US District Court in Chicago. Uh, Professor Eagley uh, was also a Scadden Fellow at the Illegal Assistance Foundation of Chicago. Uh, additionally, she was a Soros Justice Fellow at the Coalition for Humane uh, Immigrant Rights uh, of Los Angeles. And she was a trial attorney uh, for the Federal Public Defender in Los Angeles. So to close, I just want to say uh, how grateful, Ingrid, uh, I am that you're here with us today. Uh, in my view, uh, Professor Eagley is the best uh, interdisciplinary immigration legal scholar uh, in the country. Uh, the reason her work is so incredibly important is because not only is she empirically rigorous, uh, but she's also a very moving, uh, eloquent uh, storyteller. Uh, she's able to capture the plight of the immigrant cause in the most powerful of ways, uh, which I think we'll see this afternoon. 
So Ingrid, welcome to Indiana, and we're looking forward to your talk. So good afternoon. Thank you so much to Professor Christian and, and Dean Austin Parrish for that incredibly warm welcome. It's truly a privilege to be here, um, an honor to join all of you today. Lovely to do it in person um, and to be delivering this year's um, lecture in honor of Professor Ralph Fuchs. Um, so my talk today, Second Chances in Criminal and Immigration Law, features two areas of law that actually have a fair amount in common. Um, both areas of law have had a disproportionate impact on the poor, on immigrants, and on people of color. Um, both areas of law have also been impacted by changes um, over the past decades that have gra gradually ratcheted up the punitiveness of both systems. And there are also two areas of law that have become increasingly intertwined due to legal changes that I'll be talking about today. The criminal legal system through its mechanisms of arrest, um, incarceration, prosecution, um, is now the primary pipeline by which people are funneled into the immigration system. And in the immigration system, people face a new form of punishment. Even though they've already served any punishment that is given out in the criminal legal system, they're now subjected to mandatory detention. Um, and to deportation, which the United States Supreme Court has called separation from everything that makes life worth living. On a more personal note, these are also two areas of law, um, as Professor Krishnan's comments highlighted that I've worked in um, throughout my career, both as a public interest lawyer um, and as a scholar. So today, drawing on both my um, research as well as um, the experiences working with a range of clients over the years, I want to do three things. First, I will begin by talking about the criminal legal system. And as I will explain, there's been a growing consensus in recent years that the criminal legal system of the past needs to be reformed. Um, these sorts of incremental changes that we've seen in the past few years are often referred to as second chance reforms. And these are reforms that acknowledge um, the racial bias in the criminal legal system, that attempt to correct for past injustices, and that reward personal growth. Second, I want to argue that the immigration system could benefit and should benefit from similar types of changes that would acknowledge um, and create opportunities for a second look. Third, I want to conclude here with a few remarks that will bring us back to the reason why we're all gathered here today, and that is to celebrate the incredible legacy of Professor Ralph Fuchs. So um, what do I mean by second chances? Um, I think we've all, it's fair to say that we've all benefited from second chances. Um, maybe you said the wrong thing to a friend or hurt a family member, and that person forgave you and allowed that relationship to continue to grow. Second chances are really what life is all about, the opportunity to get up the next day and try harder, work, work at it even harder, um, and learn from life's inevitable um, challenges and twists and turns. Um, second chances are also what we've seen more in the criminal law of late, uh, particularly focused on allowing decision makers to turn the page backwards um, and see whether decisions that have been made in the past were the correct ones. Second chance reforms in the criminal legal system have often relied on the same kinds of mechanisms that already exist in the law, things like pardons, clemency, and other kinds of sentencing modification procedures. Um, so let me begin um, with an example. Uh, President Barack Obama, pictured here um, on his visit to a federal prison, in fact, he was the first sitting president to ever visit a federal prison in the United States. Um, he announced in 2014 a new initiative um, to begin to review the convictions of people who were serving sentences in the federal system um, and to consider granting clemency. So as background, one form of clemency that a president can grant is what's known as a commutation. And a commutation allows the president to take that sentence that has been already issued by a federal judge and reduce that sentence, or even reduce that sentence to a time served sentence. 
So when I heard about this initiative, which is known in practice as Clemency 2014, I knew that I wanted to get involved and that I wanted to involve law students um, in the Clemency 2014 initiative. So together, we took on the case of a man who'd been convicted um, in Los Angeles in federal court in 1995. By the time we took on his case, he already served over 20 years in federal prison. Although his conviction was for a nonviolent drug offense, this husband and father of a young son was sentenced to die in prison, life without the possibility of parole. And when I say life without the possibility of parole in the federal system, due to the Sentencing Reform Act of 1984, life is a life sentence. Uh, there's no longer a parole board in the federal system to come in and take a second look and to determine at a later point whether that sentence is appropriate or necessary. Prosecutors handling his case had used a prior conviction for a minor nonviolent drug offense, one that today probably wouldn't be prosecuted or at the most would be a misdemeanor to enhance his sentence to a mandatory life sentence. Even the district judge who handled his case, um, District Judge Henry Hupp in the Central District of California believed that issuing a life sentence was too harsh he wrote in the sentencing order that I have excerpted here, the court believes it is a harsh result that this relatively minor felony offense be counted toward requiring a mandatory life sentence. One moment that still sticks out in my memory was when we were leaving the federal prison together with the students, a, a guard at the prison followed us out. And as we were leaving, he leaned in and whispered something to the students. He said, referring to our client, he doesn't belong in prison. Think about that. The guard who stood watch day in and day out knew that this outcome was not the right one. Fortunately, President Obama agreed. And on August 3rd of 2016, President Obama commuted his life sentence. Pictured here in a photograph, which was taken by my then nine-year-old um, daughter, Audrey, um, is um, our group here with our client in the middle, flanked by the legal team, um, celebrating that moment when he came back home to Los Angeles on a bus at the bus station in downtown Los Angeles. That was certainly a day I know that I will never forget. Over the course of his presidency, um, this was no longer, by no means an isolated grant. Um, over 1,700 people were granted clemency um, by President Obama, and mainly people serving life or extremely long sentences for nonviolent drug convictions. So I think we can see here that work of second chances beginning, um, but only just starting to get started. So how did we get here? Um, I, I, how did we come to you know, sort of tie the hands of this federal judge who knew that this was the wrong outcome, but had nothing that he could do other than to sort of write something in the sentencing order? Many trace this rise in mass incarceration back to the war on drugs, which was a law enforcement campaign started in the 1970s. Um, as a child growing up during those years in Indiana, I'm from West Lafayette, I, I can remember sitting in health class and learning that drugs fried your brain. I think maybe, maybe some of you who are, are from my generation um, can remember that. Um, this is the televised image that was always on television, um, which you know was of, a, of an egg frying in a frying pan. Um, I, I think we could never really quite figure out like what does the egg have to do with drugs? But it, it seemed terrifying nonetheless. Um, and really got you know more and more Americans on board with this um, with what to, what was to come. Um, when I was a senior in high school, Congress passed the Anti Drug Abuse Act of 1986, um, and with that came um, the introduction of mandatory minimums for drug offenses. It also introduced the now infamous 101 disparity for crack cocaine to powder cocaine, um, which not only created a very unfair disparity but a racially discriminatory disparity because African Americans were more likely um, to be convicted of the crack form rather than the powder form of exactly the same drug and, and received far longer sentences. 
So continuing this trend in 1994, um, Congress passed and President Bill Clinton signed the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, commonly referred to just as the crime bill. So the crime bill um, uh, um, gave billions of dollars in federal funding for states um, in exchange for those states in enacting so-called truth and sentencing laws, which required individuals to serve at least 85% of the sentence imposed, sort of taking out of the state system, similar to what had happened in the federal system, um, the ability of parole boards to come in and take a second look at sentencing outcomes. Um, for those of you who are interested in more about sentencing, I know you have some real experts on your faculty and Professor Eaglin and Professor Scott, um, who've written a lot in this area. Um, but just to summarize, the results of all of this were dramatic. Um, so in 1980, when I was in sixth grade, there were just 500,000 people behind bars in the United States. And not that much longer later, when I was a public defender in 2008, um, we have 2.3 million people behind bars in, in the United States, um, the highest rate of incarceration in the world. Um, Another crucial statistic is that African Americans and Latinos made up 60% of those who were behind bars during this time, although they were only 30% of the population. But what I really want to emphasize today is something that we never thought was possible back in the time here at this height when I was advising people about their massive sentencing exposure in the federal system. Um, and that is that both states and federal legislators, legislators have taken steps to begin to ch make some changes, at least in the criminal legal systems, um, to, to take a step back towards those harsh results. Most recently, the First Step Act was passed in 2018 with bipartisan support and signed into law by President Donald Trump. Um, the First Step Act reduced mandatory minimums for federal drug crimes, and it also provided an important avenue for people to petition the courts um, for, for um, compassionate release, um, which is something that we've seen increasingly being used under COVID and also for people serving long-term sentences, something I'd be happy to talk about um, in the question and answer, because I've also involved students in that initiative. Uh, President Trump um, touted the bill um, with great pride at the State of the Union address in 2019. Um, you can see pictured here, some of you may have seen, seen his speech on television, um, Matthew Charles, who is in the front row with his hands up, um, who was the first individual to um, be released from federal prison under the First Step Act. President Trump introduced him as a special guest of the president that night um, and explained that the First Step Act had, quote, reformed sentencing laws that had wrongly and disproportionately harmed the African-American community. So, so far I've outlined a growing willingness in the criminal legal system to make some changes um, that take a second look and reevaluate harsh policies of long um, and and mandatory prison sentences that are unjust and racially discriminatory. Um, I want to turn now to talking about the other side of the equation, the immigration system. Um, so to start with a story, about a decade ago, um, I worked with some UCLA students to represent a man who was in deportation proceedings. Um, He'd grown up in the United States, spent his entire life in the United States from, from the time that he was a baby and his mother brought him into the United States. However, for a variety of reasons, his parents had never legalized his status. Um, and so therefore um, he found himself in deportation proceedings. In some respects, our clients was lucky. First, he had legal representation and legal representation is not guaranteed in our immigration system, um, unlike in the um, criminal legal system. Um, and second, he was married to a United States citizen and the couple had a young child at the time. Um, although you would think that being married to a United States citizen would mean that automatically you could adjust your status to become a lawful permanent resident, unfortunately, our immigration system is not structured to really support and bring families together. Um, so not everyone will qualify for um, this form of relief known as adjustment of status. Um, but fortunately, because he'd entered with a visa as a baby, he was eligible to adjust his status. Um, 
At the hearing, um, which took place in detention, when it became clear that the government would not oppose and that the court would grant that application to adjust his status, the judge leaned in to talk to him. And the judge said um, that he needed to be careful. He needed to be very careful. Why? And I still remember this quote, there are no second chances in immigration law. The judge was right. Um, and so how did it, we come to have this immigration system that offers so few second chances um, and that is so unforgiving and so resistant to change? From the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was passed in 1882, racism has been baked into our immigration system. Beginning in 1921, the United States adopted race-based national origin quotas that, legitima that legitimized a white's preferred system for lawful immigration into the United States. Although these race-based quotas were removed from our law during the Civil Rights Act, Civil Rights era, when the um, Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 was passed, they were soon replaced with something else. Um, and what they were replaced with was the crime control measures um, that I've already started to introduce um, that have been disproportionately targeted at Black and Latino communities. In 1996, two years after the crime bill was passed, Congress passed and President Bill Clinton signed a pair of laws in the, that, that radically changed the immigration system. Um, and those are the Illegal Immig Immigration Reform and Responsibility Act, or IRA-IRA, and the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, or ADEPA. These laws did a whole number of things, but um, notably, they instituted new mandatory detention rules for people who had a whole range of criminal convictions. They greatly expanded the grounds on which someone can be removed from the United States. And they took away from immigration judges the discretion to consider individualized factors in deciding whether someone should be deported from the United States. So as you can see here, the result of these 1996 immigration laws have been absolutely dramatic. Since they passed in 1996, over 7 million people have been deported from the United States. That's more than three times the number of people that were deported from the United States in the entire era preceding going back to 1892. Moreover, like incarceration during this period, deportations were also heavily racialized and gendered, focused on Latino and Black men. The 1996 laws um, had tragic personal consequences for immigrants. Um, these photographs, um, which were shared with me by Amos Gregory, who's a veteran of our military and also an artist, um, depict a mural on the border um, between Tijuana and San Diego. This um, border wall stands in an area that's known as Friendship Circle. Um, and it's a place where people come to the border to talk to their loved ones who have been deported through that fence. On one side of the fence, that's on the left-hand side here, you can see painted in that mural that was painted by a group of deported veterans, an upside down flag of the United States, which is a longtime military distress signal. But on the right-hand side um, of that same mural, which you can see in the other photograph, you can see on it painted dozens of names of individuals who are all veterans of our military who've been deported from the United States. One of those names on that wall is Staff Sergeant Melvin Salas. So here's a photograph of um, Staff Sergeant Melvin Salas at an airbase in Saudi Arabia during Operation Desert Storm. <clears throat> Melvin served our nation honorably. Um, but like many veterans, had difficulty adjusting to civilian life when he came back to the United States. He sustained a conviction for getting involved in a fight at a party, and he was subjected to the 1996 immigration laws. He was mandatorily detained, and he was put into deportation proceedings. In those deportation proceedings, he had no right to a lawyer to represent him, um, but he did write a letter to the immigration judge I have that letter and he's given me permission to share an excerpt from it. 
So these are his words. I truly believe that yes, I am an American at heart and in so many other aspects. It's the paperwork stating that I'm an American that I regretfully lack. I've been raised to know only one country, the United States of America. I remember as a child being taught to stand before the flag of the United States and place my right hand over my heart as I recited the Pledge of Allegiance. On my 18th birthday, I went and fulfilled my duty and registered for the selective service. I enlisted the United States in the United States Army. I took the oath and solemnly swore that I would support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. My family members all reside in the United States and are United States citizens. If deported, I will have no one to turn to. I will be leaving my children and my family behind. I will be an American lost in a foreign country. Despite these enormously strong equities, 39 years as a resident in the United States, years spent in honorable military service, children and family who are citizens of our country, the judge was unable to consider any of these factors in reviewing his case and was essentially mandated to order um, deportation. I think his deportation was particularly unjust because our immigration laws recognize um, that anyone who serves our military, even just one day in active combat, is entitled to automatic United States citizenship. But our government has lagged in its ability to help veterans with that paperwork to become United States citizens. And as a result, we have people like Staff Sergeant Melvin Salas and untold numbers of other veterans who have been um, deported. So how can things change? How can we bring people um, like Sergeant Salas back to the United States? And that's what I wanna use the last um, bit of my comments here to address is some potential changes in the law. So first, I think that the immigration law um, needs to um, be reformed to allow judges to consider individualized factors um, before ordering someone deported. The immigration law used to have a provision like this. It was known as the former provision 212C of the immigration law. I have no doubt that if that provision was in effect at the time of the deportation hearing for Sergeant Salas, um, that the judge would have granted um, that form of relief. A related part of bringing second chances into the immigration law would also be um, sort of creating a right to come home. And that's something that has been proposed um, in the New Way Forward Act, which was just introduced um, last year. In other words, to allow people to take advantage of changes that are made to the immigration law who have already been deported. A second reform that I want to highlight is one that um, could be implemented at the state level. Um, and that is the revitalization of the governor's role to grant pardons. Um, under the immigration law, there is one remedy um, that can allow people who have criminal convictions um, to have that conviction forgiven and no longer be a basis for their deportation. And that is a pardon by either the president or um, by a governor of a state. With a pardon, non-citizens with convictions um, will not lose their hard-earned status as a lawful permanent resident and can qualify for different forms of relief. Um, so Governor Jerry Brown of California, who most recently served from 2011 to 2019, I think provides a really important case study of how pardons can be used as a form of immigration relief. Um, during his tenure, as you can see here, he granted more pardons than any other governor um, in in our state history has 1,332 pardons. Um, and many of those were for, for individuals um, who were non-citizens. In fact, one of those pardon recipients was Paul Soak. Um, Paul's parents met in a refugee camp um, as they escaped the Khmer Rouge regime um, in Cambodia. He was actually born there at the camp and came to the United States when he was just 61 days old. After his parents separated, um, he was raised by his father in Long Beach, California. Um, and at the age of 17, his father was diagnosed with cancer and passed away. Um, Paul Soak found himself all alone um, and became entangled um, in the juvenile justice system, um, which was notoriously not very forgiving in the 1990s. 
prosecuted him as an adult and he found himself um, sentenced to prison as a child. When California finally rectified this um, mistake and created second chances for youth offenders by passing Senate Bill 260, Paul was granted early parole. And by this time, he was 65. I mean, 30, sorry, sorry, 35. Um, but that didn't end things. Um, due to the 1996 immigration laws, um, he was taken into an immigration prison um, and charged with deportation. Unfortunately, he was one of the people that um, Governor Brown um, pardoned. Um, so in, in 2018, Governor Brown pardoned um, Paul Soak. He's pictured here holding a copy of that pardon together with our legal team. Um, and in that pardon, one of the things that um, Governor Brown um, pointed out was just the enormous outpouring of community support um, for ensuring that that pardon was granted and for keeping him here um, in California. Um, today, Paul is a very well-known um, organizer um, at the Youth Justice Coalition in Los Angeles, and his work is widely recognized as making our communities safer um, by helping at-risk youth um, and by being involved in trying to change the laws in the criminal legal system at the local, state, and national level. So um, the third reform that I want to urge today um, is establishing a right to um, access to counsel um, in, in the immigration courts. And I know that uh, you have some experts in this area as well. Professor Christian's written a lot about um, access to counsel. Um, and I know Professor Quintanilla has also um, you know, doing research on access on, on access to justice. Um, so this is, I think this is a really important area in immigration, especially because there isn't a right to appointed counsel. Um, the, in, in many ways, you could say, well, this really isn't a second chance reform. It's more of like a first chance reform. Uh, but I think it's important to talk about in this context because I, th I think without access to a lawyer, we find that the, the opportunities to, to access the kinds of reforms that I'm talking about would be almost impossible. Um, so this is an area that I've done some research on together with Stephen Schaefer. We published a paper um, looking at, you know, sort of asking the question, do people have lawyers in immigration court? And what we found was really dismal. Um, nationally, only 37% of um, immigrants in the um, in, in, in our courts between 2007 and 2012 um, had a lawyer. And for those who were detained, the situation was even worse. Only 14% um, had gone to court with a lawyer. Um, without counsel, we found that it was almost impossible to prevail. So this is looking at success rates by, um, by detention status. Um, and we found that for those who were detained, um, they were 10 and a half more times more likely to succeed in their immigration case if they had a lawyer representing them. I mean, immigration law is complex. Um, at, you know, any legal proceeding um, would be um, very challenging without a lawyer, but immigration particularly so. Um, so states and localities have worked together um, with advocates to create programs at the local level. So for example, in Los Angeles, we have the Los Angeles Justice Fund that provides representation for people who are in deportation proceedings. Um, and, and, and what I wanna urge is that we grow those types of programs and also perhaps even consider a national program that would provide access in those hard to reach areas, particularly for people who are detained um, in states and localities where there, there haven't been these kinds of initiatives to start programs to provide representation for individuals um, in immigration court. Um, so I want to conclude um, by taking us back um, to the really important reason um, why we're here, and that is to celebrate the legacy of Professor um, Ralph Fuchs, um, who's had a very meaningful impact um, on, on the law school here. I unfortunately, you know, had never, have never met him. Um, I would have loved to have taken a class with him as a law student um, or have met him um, as an academic. But from what I've learned, you know, he is someone who has really, really integrated in his career, um, both the importance of um, being a, a public interest lawyer um, with his scholarship. So he's someone who was a pioneering scholar in the area of administrative law, really at a 
time that that field was growing, but also um, incredibly dedicated to the American Civil Liberties Union, even starting the chapter of the ACLU um, here in Indiana. From looking at his scholarship, I also see that he was well ahead of his time in recognizing that law schools should devote more attention um, to the study of social problems and the actual operation of legal institutions. Um, one thing that he's written about is that the university should um, ha really has sort of a duty to equip law students to um, be critical of the law and to develop the kinds of tools to want to change it. Um, so I think the last thing that I want to say is really directed to all of you wonderful law students in, in the room. Um, and that is to say that, you know, although you're probably still figuring out what direction you want to take in the law and exactly what area um, you want to specialize in, you know, no matter what you decide um, to pursue, I want to urge you to always, uh, you know, take on the cases of people, people who, who really need legal representation. Right, um, the people for whom access to a lawyer could be life changing. Um, these kinds of initiatives that I've talked about, things like Governor Brown's pardon initiative and clemency 2014 under President Obama didn't just happen on their own. They weren't just announced and rolled out. They relied on you know, the incredible work of the applicants, um, you know, their, their family members and loved ones who have you know, fought for them and supported them throughout, um, through, throughout the entire process and advocates and organizers who helped to make those changes in the law. But they also relied on an army of legal volunteers. Um, and that's all of you, and that's where you can come in. And so I encourage you, you know, when these changes come to the immigration law, as I hope and believe they will, you know, to, to get involved, to, um, you know, to take on cases. I think that through that, you'll really see the power of the law to change the lives of an individual. Um, but perhaps even more importantly, um, you know, by stepping into immigration prisons, by seeing our beleaguered immigration courts from the inside, um, you know, you will really start to understand and see some of the true injustices that are taking place in the immigration system and be part of, you know, that important conversation to change it. So thank you so much. Uh, so before we open it up, I have to announce uh, that there's a, the CLA attendance code, which is 72273, for those of you who are looking for CLA credit, 72273. Uh, so I think the way we're going to do this is to have people come down here and ask questions so we can get picked up on the mic. Uh, so happy to have people start. Oh, please, please, yeah. Thank you, Professor Igui, uh, for the lecture. So um, I have a background in um, nonprofit in New York. So I was a social worker working in New York with uh, survivors of human trafficking, uh, sexual violence, and domestic violence. So in New York, a, um, a court system called Human Trafficking Intervention Court, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it, was created um, because a lot of the human trafficking survivors were uh, identified when they were arrested during the police raids in uh, massage parlors. So I guess the, the state and prosecution wanted to give these survivors a second chance. So they were waiting to charge them with um, solicitation of prostitution or prostitution. So I believe it's a misdemeanor or a lesser crime than um, massage uh, massage without license, which is a felony in New York. But oftentimes these, these survivors, my clients, what they were really doing was just massage without license. Um, but they didn't have the uh, language access or um, financial access to the professional trainings. And often, even though you, you have a license from out of state, New York doesn't allow you to transfer the license to New York. So. I guess by charging them with the lesser crime, they did have a second chance in immigration because in later stages of T visa, U visa, or even deportation cases, a misdemeanor is definitely 
better in a sense than, than having a felony record. But in my opinion, the, um, the shame and um, stigma and later disc um, discrimination in employment or just the impact of the quality of life in general was beyond measurable. Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to ask you, do you think like giving people a second chance, but at the expense of emotional and, and mental um, impact, does it, is it worth it? Thank you. Yeah, well, that, that's a great question. And I um, really appreciate hearing about your experience and the important work that you were doing. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot in your question. I think one one question is, you know, whether they sh what the prosecution policy should be, right, at the local level. Like, should prosecutors have been bringing those cases in the first instance? Um, and I think that's an important thing to question, right? Like, should 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 they be have been prosecuting them, or rather, you know, providing social services? Right? And I think we're sort of nationally engaged in a conversation about, you know, what how the criminal law should be used, and and should it even be used in that type of a case? Um, another important um, aspect of your question, though, is the need to really implement the Supreme Court made a decision in 2010, the Padilla decision, um, which requires defense lawyers, public defenders to advise their clients on immigration consequences. Um, and another role of those um, Padilla, Padilla lawyers or Padilla experts in public defender offices now is to negotiate with prosecutors and to let them know about how a conviction could adversely impact um, the person that they're charging. Um, and so it sounds like maybe public defenders were involved there and at least able to, um, you know, convince the prosecutors to not pursue a conviction that would have barred them from the important kinds of relief um, that were designed for protect pre precisely that kind of a situation like the UNT visas that you've mentioned, which are for people who are trafficked or victims of crime. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. So as I understand, the scenario you described in, in the case of those veterans was as follows. So a person was a US legal permanent resident, joined the US military, was eligible to apply for citizenship right away, but chose not to, and then at some point got convicted of a crime of moral turpitude, either of the Uniform Code of Military Justice or under state law, and thus became deportable. In, in your judgment, why didn't those people choose to apply for US citizenship early on? Simply because they just didn't think about it or because they, uh, they were afraid of some adverse consequences of it, such as, for example, in a, in a loss of foreign citizenship and inability to travel abroad or an ability to own property in Mexico or something like that? Yeah, so that's a great question, you know, focusing on um, deported veterans. I mean, each case is different, but the question of why, um, why people didn't actually receive the citizenship that they were promised. I mean, you know, when you speak to people who um, are veterans of our military who've been deported, you know, they're, they tell you that, you know, re recruiters came to the high school and one of the things that is used um, all the time in recruiting people to sign up, right, for our military is that you are guaranteed an automatic right to citizen. Again, one day in active combat entitles you to an unquestionable um, right to citizenship. And that sort of makes sense, right? Someone is willing to die for our country. Um, we, we need to recognize that they are a true American, a true hero. Um, and, and so in answer to your question, what's happened is, first of all, some people believe that they already are citizens, right? They've, they've been told that citizenship is part of this process. They sign up for the military. Um, they're sent off to Saudi Arabia. Um, and they think that the paperwork has been done. In other cases, they've been given paperwork, tried to fill out the paperwork, of course, they're now overseas, they're in combat. Um, and so they may be believing that the paperwork has been done, but they come back and then once they have a conviction, they realize that the paperwork wasn't done. So um, it, it really is something that, you know, I think from the military side should be, in, should be integrated seamlessly so that it really is automatic as the law was intended to be. Um, but now we're dealing with a situation where so many people have been impacted by this fault of implementing the law properly um, that I think we really do need to create that right to come home to make a clear pathway. Thank you.
Hi, thank you for your talk. So I have a quick question. We know America's not perfect. And in the case of these veterans who have been deported, now that we know that they were veterans, we know they served in the military, is there any mechanism where they can come back, where the courts can correct what was you know, done to them? Is that yes, so that's that, that's a good question. So I know that the Biden administration is is looking to explore some avenues to bring some people back. Parole is one possibility, which is a discretionary mechanism by which we can allow someone to come to the unit into the United States without necessarily giving them like a permanent status to reside within the United States. So I think that's something that's under exploration. Um, and there have been cases of people who have been granted pardons. So I did talk about. Um, the, 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 the important role that governors have to grant pardons. And then that has allowed people to, you know, reopen their old immigration case because they no longer have this bar. Um, and in the case of a citizen to, uh, to, to, in case of someone who served in our military, who's entitled to citizenship, then they can complete that naturalization process and, and return. And there have been veterans who have, for whom that has been successful. And so I think that's another reason why we really need to open up the state, the state pardon process and also have the president use the pardon process for those who have federal convictions. The staff sergeant that you mentioned, is that his case? Did he get to come back? We, we're actually, he's someone who our clinic represents, um, and we are representing him in the pardon process. So we have, uh, we have a question from our colleague, uh, <laughs> Professor Jessica Eaglin. Um, she asks, Ingrid, uh, are the statistics for gub gubernatorial pardons in California inclusive of all criminal convictions, not just immigration-related offenses? Given that pardons decreased across the board in California, during the rise of mass incarceration, how should we understand the political implications of expanding pardons as a relief from immigration enforcement? In other words, does the politicization of immigration suggest that this avenue is not advisable? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question. Thank you, uh, Professor Eaglin, for that question. Um, so, so first, the, in answer to the to to the fact about does that include all pardons? Yes, it, those those numbers include all pardons, um, not just pardons for people who are non-citizens, but we do know from, you know, you can you can review the actual pardons. All pardon grants are public records. So we do know that quite a few of them were um, grants that were given to um, non-citizens. I think this is a question politically, you know, should, should we be focusing on, you know, pushing governors to expand um, the pardon pardon process? There are a lot of other people need pardons, not just non-citizens need pardons. Um, and a pardon is something that doesn't entirely erase or expunge a conviction. It doesn't, you know, um, eliminate the harm that was done to the victim, um, but it is something that recognizes the tremendous growth of the individual and the time that has passed. Um, I think it's important that we talk, though, about the injustice of um, you know, the, the rise of mass incarceration and the particular sort of double impact of that on non-citizens, not just in the criminal legal system, but also in the immigration system. I think this is something that the immigrant rights movement for a long time has been hesitant to talk about. And during that time, we've seen not just the rise of mass incarceration, but this rise of mass deportation. So I think, you know, despite, uh, you know, the, the potential political risks in, in, you know, depending on the state, um, this is an area where, you know, California has been very strong and seeing with Governor Brown, you know, really not just granting pardons for non-citizens, but, you know, announcing them, featuring them in the press, um, and then really the success stories of people um, who've, who have received those pardons and become real heroes um, in the community and everything that they're giving back, I think is important to also sort of change that tide. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, first, thank you for your talk today. That was great. Um, my question is, immigration itself is obviously a very politically charged issue. Um, you hear a lot of rhetoric on both sides of the aisle. And just from your research, have you seen empirical differences between the different administrations, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, and um, how enforcement actually happens at large um, under different types of administrations, I guess? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think I think one area where there has been shifts is in the use of prosecutorial discretion. Um, and I know this is an area where there has been um, research done. I don't know necessarily like measuring. Um, it's hard to get information from the federal government on exactly who is being deported and what you know you know, what the personal characteristics are to see different trends. Um, and of course, President Obama deported more people than any other president um, previously, which, you know, given that, you know, he's a Democrat, right, you might expect there to be less, uh, fewer deportations during that um, presidency. He earned the name deporter in chief, right, for, um, for, for that record of high number of deportations. Uh, but I think one thing in prosecutorial discretion that we have seen shifting is under President Obama's administration, at least toward the end, sort of a, a, a more defined um, policy as to who would be a priority for deportation. Um, then we saw under President Trump where those policies were taken away. Now under President Biden, we're starting to see prosecutorial discretions put more in place. Um, uh, you know, I think many in the advocacy community believe that we shouldn't be having these deportations in the first place, but having prosecutorial discretion policies in place and followed um, ha does have a very important impact of allowing um, people to live in the United States without constant fear of enforcement. So I think that's been one shift that we've seen between administrations recently. Thanks for your question. Any other questions? Um, first, thank you so much for, for the talk and the personal stories, you know, to complement the bigger points. I just thought it was wonderful. I'm curious, um, so you were talking about pardons and commutations and sort of ending of the sentences. I think, and I'm an employment person, so thinking about criminal law and second chances more generally, there's a whole separate um, conversation around second chances around reentry, ban the box rules, expungement, you know, things that say, yes, this crime happened, but you've served your time and let's talk about re-entry to society. And of course, with immigration and deportation, there is no re-entry, like you've done the crime. And, and, and I guess what I'm curious is, do you see any space to re, you know, to take that conversation that's happening in criminal law more generally and rethink the assumption that if you've committed a crime, deportation is the appropriate response as compared to re-entry into the place where you were already? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a really important conversation that, you know, we've we, we've have this immigration system that has been so focused on people who have criminal convictions, right? Um, and does that, as a policy, really make sense? So David Hausman, who's someone who's uh, written a, a a forthcoming paper, or maybe it's already published in the Georgetown Law Journal, has an important paper on this, sort of questioning that assumption. Um, and you know, if you look at people who have criminal convictions, they tend to be people who've lived for a longer time in the United States. Um, they may have spent, you know, like the clients I've talked about, you know, spent their entire lives in the United States, ex ex except for that, you know, almost the moment of their birth. Um, and so they have a longer time, a longer history, more time, uh, you know, for there to be a criminal conviction in the past, right, that then leads to this deportation. Is that really where we should be focused? Or if we need to have some sort of a deportation policy, should it be focused on more recent entrants or on the border, right? And I think that's an important conversation that, that we're starting to have. I, I would agree that um, focusing as we do on criminal convictions and so broadly on criminal convictions where um, so many convictions can, you know, where it's difficult for any public defender to even understand how to advise clients, although that's a constitution, you know, attaches with the Padilla decision to the Sixth Amendment, um, we really do need to, to, to make some changes in that area so that, um, so that there is more forgiveness or not even that policy or that, that aspect of our law in the first place. Great. I think we have uh, one more question here um, online. This is actually from one of my uh, immigration students. He says, Asa Gilbert says, it strikes me that even in DACA Dream in the DREAM Act policies we have, we are still often prioritizing criminality over other considerations in the deportation removal context. Do you think there is any opportunity to separate how we think about the criminal justice system and how we think of the immigration system? Or are these two fields so intertwined at this point? 
Um, they, yes, they are very deeply intertwined. Um, and I think that's where some of these reforms could come in, right? To, to bring things back. The 1996 laws were particularly um, harsh and particularly invasive in terms of the ways that they integrated the two systems. Um, and so I think there's been a lot of advocacy around trying to you know, fix 96, um, you know, even if we got back to the stage before those 1996 laws, um, we would have a lot fewer convictions that would 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 place someone in deportation in the first instance, but then also have in place a mechanism for there to be um, a consideration of individualized factors and for there to be a, a, a the, for the judge to have a role, you know, and not have their hands tied um, in just having to rubber stamp a deportation, but rather to consider the individualized factors, um, the nature of the conviction, the person's ties and contacts in the United States, their contributions um, in before actually making that decision, I think is a really important way that wouldn't entirely sever the two, the, the, the two systems from one another, um, but would, it, would, it, would at least allow them to make independent decisions from one another. Okay, well, I think we're up against the one o'clock hour. Ingrid, thank you. That was phenomenal. Thank you, really. Thank you.